Hey folks, and welcome back. Uh, so in the last couple of videos, we looked at the motivations for a feminist standpoint epistemology, uh, and we looked at the central theses of standpoint epistemology. So now we should have a pretty good sense of how this epistemological position is supposed to work. In this video, I want to differentiate between a few different versions or flavors of standpoint epistemology. We're going to look at two materialist versions, the historical material and the feminist material version, uh, and we're going to look at a social version. These are the three versions that are distinguished by tool, uh, and the social version is really the version she wants to advance. Um, but before we dive into those versions, I want to talk just a little bit about its history. Where did these ideas come from? Well, feminist standpoint theory uh, in the 1970s was inspired by the work of Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and uh, George Lukács, these, uh, these socialist thinkers who, uh, who had an account or had given an account of the possibility that the proletariat, that the working class was in a better position to understand the economic and social structures that they lived under, uh, to better, better position to grasp their limitations than were the capitalists who ran those systems. Um, and in the, uh, in the seventies, feminist theorists like uh, Sandra Harding, who you see here, uh, who works in epistemology and philosophy of science, were really looking for ways to uh, to take up some of the energy of the uh, of the women's movement uh, outside of the academy as a social movement, uh, and uh, use that to inform some of the work that they were doing, and wanted to contribute to this movement, wanted to find the political value of their work. Harding says as she was working in epistemology and, and philosophy of science at the time. She was looking at her colleagues working in ethics and political theory and could see how they could, could directly contribute to, uh, to this women's movement that was happening outside of the academy. And she wanted to be a part of that uh, and didn't quite see how her discipline could support this movement uh, until she started drawing on these ideas from Marx and Engels and Lukács. Uh, to uh, to inform her work. Um, so what were these ideas? Well, we get first the historical material version of the standpoint epistemology. Uh, what is what is uh, Tool referring to here? Well, to say that it's a material material version uh, is to say that it's materialist in, na in in nature. That it focuses on the material conditions of life. It focuses on the material conditions of production. Uh, and reproduction, but in this case in particular, the material conditions of production. Uh, so uh, Marx has this idea that um, the material conditions are what matter. Uh, they form the economic base, they form the social base. Uh, everything else is superstructure. Uh, all of the, the theorizing, the ideas, uh, the culture, that's all superstructure. What really matters are the material conditions of life. Uh, the distribution of the fundamental resources that people need in order to survive, in order to productively engage with one another, uh, in order to advance uh, the industry industry and, and the sciences. That's what matters, these material conditions. And the historical materialist says uh, that the proletariat, the working class, those who actually get their hands dirty, who uh, who work on machines in the factories, uh, not not the not the farmers, not the agrarian class, but the those who are uh, working uh, most directly with capital that's accrued by capitalists. So those who are working in factories, uh, because of their proximity to productive labor and because of their relationship to to capital, could better know the social structure of capitalism, could better understand uh, how this structure was held in place. Uh, what the norms of this structure were, what the vicissitudes of this structure were, and what the weaknesses of this structure were, what its limitations were, then could capitalists. Uh, so the proletariat is in a standpoint that has epistemic privilege if they can achieve that privilege, uh, if they can theorize themselves in a, into a position, or if they can... Um, uh, if they can develop the resources to understand their circumstances, uh, then they'll be in a better position to understand capitalism than the capitalist who runs the uh, runs the economy will be in. 
Um, and this is a, a sort of central Marxist thesis. Feminists take this up and say, whoa, wait, you historical materialists are focused on relationship to capital, but that's not the only productive relationship within society. Uh, feminists like Young, Hartsock, Harding, they argued that reproductive relationships had a similar effect, uh, that the work of women um, in reproducing uh, the proletariat that went on to uh, to work in the factories uh, and in providing uh, labor in the home that often goes unrecognized as actual labor uh, that frees up men to go out and work in the public economy. Um, they were also in a position to better understand uh, and, and better theorize their conditions than men were uh, because of the doubly oppressed position that they found themselves in. Uh, they were women of the proletariat. Right? Um, so gender, according to feminist materialists, affects the acquisition of knowledge because women have to be able to, uh, to manage the household, uh, to care for the emotional needs of men, to uh, provide for, for children, uh, to uh, care for um, or to, to do the, the cognitive and emotional work within the household, uh, to keep track of the daily schedules, to keep track of uh, you know, who's got what tests coming up and whose birthdays are coming up and did we buy all the right Christmas presents for the kids. Uh, the, the women were in charge of this, were taken to be in charge of this. Uh, and because they are in these, this position, uh, this re they have this relationship to domestic labor, uh, they are in a better position to understand the limitations of the social structure that puts them in those positions. The, the social structure that structures labor relations uh, within capitalism so that men go out and work in factories, women stay home and enable them to do that by taking care of all of this labor that is hidden within the household. And when they do go out to work, they end up working uh, what Arlie Hochschild called the double double shift. Right? They go out and work in the factory. They go out and work uh, in uh, in the, the public economy. And then they have to come home and they're still expected to do all of this labor within the home to maintain the home uh, while men are not expected to do this labor. Uh, and this puts women, according to feminist, this feminist materialist uh, version of the standpoint theory, puts women in a position to better understand the limitations of this system, to better grasp how this sort of social structure functions. Uh, men, on the other hand, have blinders to this, right? They don't see the work that women are doing. They don't, they don't recognize it as work that women are doing. It's hidden from them in many ways. They just expect their clean clothes to be there, their children to be fed, dinner to be on the table, uh, birthdays to be taken care of, bills to be paid, right? They expect all of this to, to, to just happen and they think that it is just happening and don't recognize this labor. Um, they have blinders on, and so they don't see the effects of this system. They don't see its limitations. So those are the materialist versions, um, but uh, there are there are some problems with the materialist versions. Uh, one central problem with the materialist version is that not all women are in these positions. Um, we've upended some of the uh, the economic constraints that women face, and so women uh, do spend more time working in the economy outside of the home. And many of us live in more egalitarian homes now, where these expectations aren't in place. Um, but there's still a social version to, to help us make sense of standpoint epistemology. The social version uh, says that material relations of production and reproduction are not the only relationships that shape what we can know. Social hierarchies have a similar effect. Um, Gail Polhouse, who you see here, uh, argued that living in conditions of marginalization or oppression gives rise to shared experiences among uh, the oppressed class or the marginalized class. They have similar a similarity of experience that they can talk about with one another, share with one another, and they develop language and concepts and mode of engagement for understanding, modes of engagement for understanding their condition, 
right? They'll develop ways of talking about the experiences that they're having. And when they do this, they develop conceptual resources that can direct attention, organize thought, and structure reasoning in such a way uh, that um, they, they can start to, uh, to develop an account of what is happening to them, of the social position that they are in, what supports this social structure that keeps them in this position that leads to them continuing to have these experiences that they're trying to identify uh, and start to talk about the ways in which that is problematic, that is oppressive, that is dangerous, that is harmful to them. Um, so they can develop these communal resources, these conceptual resources. Uh, and the community that they're in, the community that they form, shapes what will count as a reason for them. So they'll be able to hear other women, for example, who have these shared experiences or other people of color who share experiences with them. Uh, they'll be able to hear them talking about their shared experiences uh, and develop help to de helping to develop these conceptual resources when men who are not part of this shared experience, who are not part of this oppressed or marginalized community, uh, may not accept these accounts as reasons for changing their behavior or reasons for re-examining the social structures that are in place. Uh, men might simply ignore those sorts of claims. I want to make this all a bit more precise now. So in the next couple of, our next lecture, I'm going to go through a few examples uh, to really pin down this standpoint, this social version of the standpoint, uh, uh, standpoint theory.